Uh, take your Bible, turn to 1 John, if you would. 1 John, and that's where we're going to start tonight. I appreciate you being with us tonight, all you people online. appreciate your prayers for me um, and for our church and the things that we do. Uh, this is about the sickest I've been in a long time. Um, the, back in 1993... It was in December of 93 when I resigned the, being pastor of the church at Richwoods. And it was supposed to be a special day. We were supposed to have a, a Christmas program that night. And um, I had practiced with the church. I was going to play the piano and sing some songs. The choir was going to sing. And um, during that afternoon, Lisa and I would, a lot of times, you know, we'd have to drive all the way out to Richwoods, come back home Sunday afternoon, rest, and drive back for service. We drove home, ate some, ate some mid-afternoon dinner, and between then and church time, I got horribly sick. And I mean, whole body ached like you wouldn't believe. Not even hardly able to stand up. I did the rehearsal, couldn't do the service. I could not physically stand up. I was laying down in the basement of the church, sick as a dog. My last service at that church, I had already resigned. And some guys came down, literally picked me up and carried me to our van. Lisa started driving home that night. And a wave hit me on the way home. And I, it was like, I, again, I felt like I was going to die. You just get a sickness that just hits you. It was the flu or some kind of virus like that. And I said, I told Lisa, I said, stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. She said, what's the matter? Kids are going into, the girls are crying. Lindsay's in the back going, is dad going to die? And I'm going, I hope I do. I don't want to live through this. And I opened the door and had Lisa not grab my coat, I'd have fallen plumb out, I think. Anyway, I got home that night. I hurt all night into the next day, That's, and Saturday felt like that. I won't get into the details, is that okay? Good, anyway, so uh, it, takes a lot, it takes a lot out of you, so I'm slowly getting all that back, and I appreciate everybody's um, patience with me. Uh, I'm human, I'm normal, close to normal. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, uh, do you believe the Bible? Okay, now I want you to think about what we're reading here, and I'll tell you where I'm going here in a minute. If we look at 1 John 1, <clears throat> 1 John 1 doesn't end until verse 3. That's a whole sentence there, those three verses, so I'm going to read them all together. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That is, all of those words are very important. Very important because it gets down to how does God speak to us? How does God speak to us? And there's a lot of crazy, wrong views in what's called Christianity. I mentioned during the song service a guy warning about the music of Hillsong, Bethel Redding. He mentioned Stephen Furtick who is a mega church pastor, that guy is, that guy's perverted, if you ask me, okay? And when you read the descriptions of false prophet, it's there. And so, but they're, they're, they were just warning about that music because what they bring with that music is their false doctrine. And their false doctrine is, God will speak to you in multitudes of ways, not necessarily limited to the Bible, God can speak to you and say things to you he wouldn't say to anybody else. So what does your Bible say? Our hands have handled, we've seen it with our eyes, the word of life. For the life was manifested. That means it appeared in front of us. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. John, when we help people, what do we give them? Almost every time, without fail, when somebody comes by for help, what do we give them? Bible. I was hoping you'd say a Mike Hoggard DVD, but Bible's good enough. <laughs> Just kidding. That which we have seen and heard, declare we 
unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then verse 4, and these things, what? Write we unto you, that your joy may be full. What we share with people outside of this church did not come out of our head. It did not come out of somebody else's head. It came out of the book. It came out of what was written. And tonight, we're going to go through the importance of having it written down. I was a lousy note taker in school. Terrible note taker. It took me getting out of college... And then when God really began to make me study this book, that's when I started taking notes, and I'm glad I did. Because I would write things down, then forget it. Go back to my notes, read it again. Go back to the Word of God. I would think I knew a verse and say it, Brother James, wrong. And be proud of myself. See, this is what I believe. I go back to the Word of God and read that verse, and I'm going, who changed the Bible? Obviously, it's not me that's wrong. But I was wrong the whole time. So we have this common bond between us that unites every one of us. That is the word of God. And we all believe the same book. We believe the same words. We may not agree on touching every little thing. That to me is not important. We believe the same book. And that's what we can share with people. Now look at verse 7. This is where it gets important. But if we walk in the light, as he, meaning Christ, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. I knew some missionaries' kids when I went to college. Uh, the Combs family, his mom and dad were missionaries down in Brazil, and they all speak Portuguese down there. And this young man who was a good young man, I loved him to death. We were good friends. His name was Kemper. And Kemper would tell us, you know, we dealt with a lot of satanic possession down there. In third world countries, that's what you get. It's here in America, it's just not as open as it is in some of these other countries where Christianity does not necessarily flourish. And he said, there would be people come to our church that it was obvious that they were there sent by Satan himself to disrupt that church service and disrupt the preaching of the word of God and to, to stop what we were doing. And he said, my dad, God led him to do this. My dad had a test for these people coming in because there was one thing, there was a verse, if he suspected somebody was under demonic or devil's control, they don't like the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't like it. So he would hand them a Bible in Portuguese and have them read 1 John 5, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And he told us if they were possessed, they would either not be able to see the verse, read the verse, or skip over the blood of Jesus part. That was one of the tests, it was just one of the tests, but that was the test that they did with people that were possessed. And then they would start the process of maybe trying an exorcism. But anyway, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, that's what I was preaching about Sunday, and the truth is not in us. Whose version of the truth? God's. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, is faithful and just. Now, he's two things here. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As if I lead someone to Jesus, if I'm witnessing to them, I've got them down, I'm reading the Bible. I go through 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, that's our part. That's our responsibility. God is two things here. Number one, he's faithful. Meaning that God... His character is such that he will not ever deceive us. He's faithful. This Bible's telling us that if we confess our sins to God, God will forgive those sins. He's, he's morally obligated to do it. That's the faithful part. Then he's legally obligated. He is faithful and just. 
Meaning that God is legally obligated to forgive our sins. We learned this, Sterling, when we were taking our concealed carry class. If you remember, the guy taught us the difference between the laws in some states. In Hawaii, the law said that if you meet these qualifications, the state of Hawaii may issue you a license. That sounds good. The state of Missouri says if you meet these qualifications, the state of Missouri shall issue you a license. The difference in the meaning of the two words. May in Hawaii means we don't have to if we don't want to. Even if you meet the qualifications as the government, we are not necessarily bound in any way, shape, or form to give you a license to carry a concealed weapon. And I went, are you kidding me? No, lots of people, they said lots of people apply in Hawaii and they never get a license, even though they're qualified. The state of Missouri says, shall, meaning the government, by its own terms, is obligated. And you can sue and win, and a guy did. Because he went to the license office, state of Missouri, took the class, met the qualifications, sheriff's department, the whole thing. He goes to the license office, the governor at the, of Missouri at the state of the time was a liberal. And he tried to get this thing going where these license offices were getting all this information on all these people coming in to register for a concealed carry license. He was building a secret database on people who had guns. And so the license office told this guy, well, we're going to need to see a birth certificate. We need to see this. We need to see that. And the guy said, no, you don't. And they said, yeah, we do. He said, no, you don't. I met the qualifications. I want my license. They said, we're not giving it to you. He sued and won because the law said so. Is it important that those laws be written down? Is it important? So if God is faithful and just, what is it that a guy can do what's right even though it's not legally demanded that he do what's right? That's the moral part. He is faithful. But if the law says an officer, a judge, some sort of court official, some sort of public official, if the law says that they must do this, they must do it. The Attorney General of the United States of America, God bless him, he's suing New Jersey, Washington State, and California. Suing those three states. You know why? They have sanctuary cities. And they've said, we don't care what the law says, we're going to let illegal aliens come into our cities all we want to and we're not going to follow the law so the attorney general of the united states of america says you're guilty of a crime and i'm going to hold you accountable for it and since 2016 our president has been throwing out old judges bringing in good judges federal judges so that when these lawsuits come to the courts we now have judges who won't automatically throw them out because they're liberal. They're going to follow the law. Is it important that the law is written down? Amen? Look up on the screen. What is that? Certificate of marriage. Anybody can say, I'm married. Anybody can say that. Okay? I've had people over the years ask me, I don't want to go get some state thing. Well, okay, what are you going to tell the government on your tax forms? Are you going to tell them you're married? Are you going to tell them you're not married? Because if you tell them you're married, they may ask for proof that you're married. There's proof that Lisa and I are married. Number one, we have a copy of it. The courthouse in Hillsboro has a copy of it. We can legally prove that we were joined in marriage July 10th, 1987 in the presence of witnesses. We can legally prove that. Or are you going to tell them you're not married because you can't prove it, but you believe in your eyes that you're married. 
So you're not being honest to somebody. You're not being honest with them. Either you're married or you're not married. And if you're married, you say you're married. Is there proof that you married? Because some people, hey, it's fornicate. And they call that marriage. And it's not marriage. There has to be proof. Uh, what is this? Anybody tell what that is just by looking at it? Car title. Is that important that there is a piece of paper that identifies? Lindsay's shaking her head. Is it important that there is a, an official document that says this particular automobile with these numbers on the license, on the, on the, um, on the engine, on the door, different places in the car, that this vehicle belongs to me? I'll ask this question. Is ownership of property wrong in the eyes of God? No. God gives us that right. How can you prove that you own a vehicle? I hear it on Life PD all the time. I just bought this last night from a guy. It's a $20,000 automobile. What'd you pay the guy? 300 bucks? What does that tell you? Where's the paper? He didn't give me no paper. Where either you're dishonest or you're an idiot. Okay, what about this mortgage? Is it important if you're going to spend a hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars on a house? Is it important to you and the bank that there is a document that says what this house is, where it is, how big it is, who be, who it belongs to, who it doesn't belong to? Because in two thousand eight, what we found out was. When the banks started pulling all these loans and you had squatters inside there that weren't paying their mortgage, they were saying, they're stealing our house, man. They're stealing our house, man. It's not your house if you didn't pay for it. You signed a document that swore that you would abide by the terms. This wasn't a handshake deal. You would never do that on something that expensive. Buying a pack of gum from somebody, that's one thing. What about this? Would you go to a doctor who did not have a license to do medicine? No! I mean, you may go to him for something else. But if you're going to go to a doctor, go to a doctor. And I want to see where you went to school. I want to see who said you could do these things. Is there a law against practicing medicine without one of these? You can get in big trouble. Okay? What about this? Is a pilot's license. Is it important? <laughs> what do you mean? You've never flown. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's a pilot's license. If you don't have a pilot's license, I don't get on the plane. Okay? Uh, rental agreement. Sterling, how vital is that? Pretty vital. And you can't make an agreement. You can't, I wouldn't rent anything from anybody if I didn't have a written contract. Written contract. And I'll, I'll read something to you in a minute. This is... An automotive service. This is a mechanic's license. A license to work on a vehicle. Is there even a law for that in the state of Missouri? Yes, because in the state of Missouri, they do car inspections, safety inspections. And I could ask JR, JR, write me out a piece of paper saying my car is in good shape. Why not? Okay. I will admit one year, I had an old clunker I used to drive back and forth to work all the time, and I took it to a guy that I knew. And he said, Mike, what do you want? I said, I want an uh, inspection sticker. So the guy raised the hood, and I said, no, you didn't hear me. I don't want the inspection, I want the sticker. Oh, okay, so he gave me the sticker. <laughs> okay, that was, that was back in the old days. Now, let me, I want to spend some time reading this. It's the difference between a verbal and a written contract. Most verbal contracts are legally binding. However, 
There are some exceptions depending on the construction of the agreement and the purpose of the contract. In many cases, it's best to create a written agreement to avoid disputes. For instance, employers, employees, and independent contractors may find it invaluable to document the terms of their agreements in an employment contract or service agreement. Although an oral agreement may be legally enforceable, it can be tough to prove in court. Judges like to see documents. What are the elements of a valid contract? Depending on your source, there can be anywhere from four to six elements that make a contract legally binding. Some sources consolidate elements on the same title. Uh, they are, number one, offer and acceptance. I'm going to run through this very quickly. Offer and acceptance means I made John, John an offer. I'm going to sell John a pencil that I have on my desk. It's a $100 pencil. John's going to pay me off a penny every other week until it's paid off. So we write this down in a contract. I offer him that contract he accepts it. How does he accept it? Signing it. That's been done for years. Um, even in days when people couldn't sign their name, they would say, make your mark. And a guy would simply make some form of mark that identified that it was his mark, and that was, that was held up in court. So there has to be an offer. There has to be an acceptance by the second party. Number two, it must be a lawful purpose. It cannot be something that breaks the law. You cannot have a legal contract with somebody. I can't hire John to kill Sterling. Most of the time. I can't hire John to kill... That, he can sue me. He will not get anywhere. It's an illegal contract. Must be a lawful purpose. Number three, must be a lawful consideration. Number four, certainty and completeness of terms. Let me explain this. There's an element of the law, I'm going to say this wrong, but it's called... Something like quantum merowit. And I'm not saying this quite right, but it says that if, if John contracts with me and John's going to build a house for me, and it's a $100,000 house, and he does everything except put the doorknobs on, I could say, he didn't finish the job, I'm not paying him. But the law says that for the work that he did, I must pay him. Legally, I must pay him. Even if he didn't finish all of the contract, anybody can put the doorknobs in. I have to pay him. I can deduct what is legally allowed, but I have to pay him. So certainly in completeness of the terms. Free consent of the parties. Okay, You can't tough guy a guy into signing a contract. It's not legal. Capacity. They both have to be of a sound mind. For a verbal agreement to be binding, the elements of a valid contract need to be in place. To illustrate how the elements of a contract create binding terms in a verbal agreement, we'll use the example of a man borrowing $200 from his aunt to replace a flat tire. Um, I, I, won't, I won't read all of this, but those are basically the terms for that. And let me say this, and I've said this before. Once you sign a written contract, contracts are always dated. Dates are important to the contract. Very important. Okay? Once you sign a dated contract, that contract bears the force of law. You cannot make a verbal agreement after the signing of the written agreement, it's not, it won't be held up. The judge will throw it out because the written contract was binding. This is my point. All of these people who say, God told me this, God told me that, I heard it from God directly, or as in the case of Joseph Smith, an angel of God came and told me this, Paul accounted for that. Though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel, let him be a curse. We have the terms both in the Old Testament law in the book of Deuteronomy and the New Testament, the book of Revelation, at the end of the, of the contract. It specifically says, no words added, no words taken away. That was, that was the last book given. And that's important because the book of Revelation is given to us 
let's say, a year after Christ died, then everything that Paul and Peter and James wrote is null. We shouldn't believe a word of it. But God's smart. God's way smarter than us. He puts the book of Revelation with those terms at the end of the contract and says, this is now binding. And anybody who messes with this contract, I'm going to void the contract on them. They are no longer qualified to be that. That hit me like a ton of bricks. When you stop and think about the number of people who accept the Bible with 64,000 less words in it than the King James. Something's fishy with that. Something's not right. Amen? Now, turn to Galatians 3. This is the Bible as a contract. And that is exactly what it is. Um, the Constitution. I believe in the Constitution. You know what? It doesn't matter if I believe in it or not. I'm living within the confines of the legal bounds of the Constitution of the United States. Meaning that I am both protected by its rights and I'm obligated by its restrictions. I cannot go over and above what the Constitution allows. I cannot be injured while I'm under the protection of the... These people who call themselves sovereign citizens, that just grinds me like fingernails on a chalkboard. Because what they want to say is, we are under the Constitution so long as it protects us, but we do not obey the Constitution as far as its restrictions. And the Constitution has valid restrictions. It all been agreed upon by every American state. You come as, state, as a state in the Union, you agree. This Constitution is the law of the land. Okay? So it's the same way with the Bible. Galatians 3.15 Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. That is exact, exactly what God said in Deuteronomy. That is exactly what Jesus said in Revelation. Once it be confirmed, John... How did you do it? You signed. In the case of us, we agreed to God's terms. Israel agreed to God's terms in the Old Covenant, saying at Mount Sinai, all that thou hast said, we will do. They said it with one voice. They can, there was an offer of God and an acceptance by Israel. It wasn't that God said... Here it is. I don't care if you agree with it or not. They agreed to it. They said, we'll do all those commandments. But they didn't. They didn't. They broke every one of them. So he, Paul's even saving, even in a man's contract, in just man's law, if a covenant is given, and if it's accepted by both parties, that's confirmed, and it has the binding force of law, and no man can add to it, and no man can take from it. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. The contract was only with Abraham and his lineage. Now, how in the world could they prove lineage 4,000 years ago? How do we do it now? DNA. DNA can show where you came from, whose bloodline you are. DNA can tell whether I'm the legitimate son of Milton Don and Judy A. Hogger. Or I belong to somebody else. DNA confirms that. DNA will tell you I'm Howard Hughes' first son. I should get all of his money. Okay? Or Donald Trump's money. DNA would prove that. Okay? So he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the deal is only Christ qualifies. Now, 
there is a condition upon which we can be in Christ. Meaning that all the blessings that are promised to God's Son can apply to us because we are in Christ. Hold your place there in Galatians and turn to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Giving you a few seconds. Verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. I used to look at that with pride and say, boy, that's me. I walk in the way of godly people. I don't stand where the sinners, I don't sit in the seat of the scornful, and I think about God's word constantly. And God said, no, you don't. You don't do that. Mike, you're not qualified. Oh, who is? Christ. And God, God keeps it. God, if it's law, God keeps it. Remember, he's faithful, morally obligated. He's just, he's legally obligated. And if the law says that I'm not qualified, I'm not qualified. So it's like that law I told you about that they want to pass through. The better way, the new way forward, Joe, that will allow convicted felons who are illegal aliens after their prison term to remain in the United States. That ain't right. That violates the law, that violates the Constitution. If it's ever passed, it'll get sued out, hopefully, with, by a judge who's got some sense, by a judge who'll uphold the law. Because the letter of the law says, if they didn't come in here the right way, they don't belong here. John Me came in this country the right way. Michael came in this country the right way. They are legally protected by the Constitution, and God bless them for it. But if you sneak in here, you're up to something, and we're going to throw you out. You want to come in? Do it the right way. Do it the legal way. Amen? Okay? So, if we are in Christ then, then we receive, by God's grace, the benefits that are given to Christ and only Christ. So verse, back in Galatians 3.17, And this I say, that the covenant, the contract that God made with Abraham, that was confirmed before of God, there it is, in Christ. Who was it confirmed in? Who's the one seed that qualified? Christ. The law, meaning the Mount Sinai law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. In other words, God has a, a contract with Abraham and to his seed that predates Mount Sinai. Which one's in force? The Abraham covenant. Mount Sinai covenant is not in force according to God because God's promise to Abraham predates. So Sterling... You signed a rental agreement with somebody, and it's dated on a certain... Every page is dated. Every page is initialed. Every page is dated. That way, if it's a four-page contract, there's proof that there were four pages when we signed this on a certain date. If somebody shows up in court a year later with a later version of the contract, that contract is thrown out. It's not in effect. The original contract was. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what he's saying here. Um, uh, verse 17 again. The law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Verse 18. For if the inheritance, and this is what the contract was all about. Inheritance, I mean think about this. A testament is a, a, a last will and testament is what somebody signs before or after they die. Before. You can't, a dead man can't sign a contract. It's signed before they die, dated, and it gives out in specific detail where all my stuff goes after I die. Because after I die, I can't have it. There's no law 
that says a man who is dead can own anything. His property, his estate has to be given to somebody. And if you don't have a will and testament, then it goes to the courts. And the courts have to try to figure out. And this takes a long time. So you have a will and a testament. And that's what he's talking about. For if the inheritance be of the law, Mount Sinai, it is no more of promise. It's earned instead of being inherited by birth. And there's a difference. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. I know I'm running out of time, but I got to say this. You know why Jim Staley's in prison right now? Jim Staley, the guy that ran the Hebrew Roots Church up in St. Peter's. The guy that does not like me and the feelings are mutual. You know why he's in prison right now? He was selling a man's insurance policy. He was selling the rights to this old man's million dollar or whatever life insurance policy. He was going to people saying, give me money every month, help me pay the premium. And when this guy dies, we all get a cut. He was selling this man's inheritance. And he did it with, he, he was selling securities without a license. I mean, they got him on fraud. He owes over a million dollars to the people he defrauded. Guy's a crook. Uh, let's see, thou shalt not steal. That's part of the law, isn't it? Okay, that's what he was doing. So if the inheritance, verse 18, be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. He gave it to Abraham before Abraham did anything. He promised it to him. Verse 19, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed, who is Christ, should come to whom the promise was made. You know what the law did? The law was there to make sure that nobody else qualified for the inheritance of Abraham. Nobody else. Only Christ. So, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a me and I think that mediator was Melchizedek. I think that was the angel that mediated the covenant that brought the covenant between God and Abraham. That's just my guess, but that's what I think. Now, a mediator, verse 20, is not a mediator of one. In other words, I can't make a contract with myself. Okay? I can't have a lawyer make a contract with me. Uh, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So God is the party of the first part. We are the party of the second part. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that what? Believe. And is it important that we have the right Jesus Christ? Are there Elvis impersonators? Bad ones. Are there Jesus impersonators? It's important that we have the right Jesus in God's courtroom. So, verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So, just very quickly, uh, i got a lot more running out of time, but I want you to understand the Bible as a contract. And contracts are built upon language. Words that have meaning. Bill Clinton got in trouble, was impeached by the House of Representatives because he went against what the word is means. You remember that? He was in depositions. And they asked him something about his affair with Lewinsky. And the word is came up. And here's Clinton, the lawyer, 
saying, depends on what your definition of the word is, is. I learned that in third grade. Okay? That's slick willy, getting away with something. Okay? There are some very, very important legal cases coming up that pertain to why they tried to throw out the President of the United States before the election. There are some very, very guilty people sitting in high places of power in the United States of America that have committed heinous crimes. And by God's grace, I hope to live to see these people come to justice. I am sick and tired of living in a corrupt world, in a corrupt country. Amen? So is it important that all the... Can we just shake our finger at Pelosi and Biden and Clinton and say, we think they're guilty, throw them in jail? No. We have to have documents that verify that they broke a written law. Just very quickly before we take prayer request, when God sent, when God spent 40 days with Moses, Moses didn't come down and just say, well, guess what God said? God said, everybody, uh, take off your golden earrings and give them all to me. Because I'm the leader and I'm supposed to be rich. And give me all your daughters. Okay? Now, some stupid people would have done it. But that's not what Moses did. He came down with a written document in his hand. And said, this is God and this is what God said. It was written down, people. And not to be tampered with. Don't mess with my marriage license. Don't mess with my house title, my car title. Don't mess with my constitution. Don't mess with my Bible. Amen?